This week on the Writer's Detective Bureau, subject matter experts, red dot lasers, and approaching suspects. I'm Adam Richardson, and this is the Writer's Detective Bureau. Welcome to episode number 66 of the Writer's Detective Bureau, the podcast dedicated to helping authors and screenwriters write professional quality crime-related fiction. And this week, I'm answering your questions about the role subject matter experts play in an investigation, the real purpose behind those red dot laser sights for firearms, and my thoughts behind approaching a suspect you want to interview. And as always, I need to thank my Gold Shield patrons, Deborah Dunbar from DebraDunbar.com, C.C. Jameson from CCJameson.com, Larry Keaton, Vicki Tharp of VickiTharp.com, Chris Ann, Larry Darter, and Natalie Borelli of NatalieBorelli.com for their support. Also, special thanks to one of my anonymous patrons for upping their pledge to the Gold Shield level. And I give these shout outs as a thank you, but you are by no means required to have your name or website mentioned. Either way, thank you all for your support. And my thanks, of course, also to my coffee club patrons for their support. You all keep the lights on in the bureau, and I truly appreciate every single one of you. You can find links to all of the I'll call them anonymous, which is the opposite of an of anonymous, right? So all the anonymous writers supporting this episode, uh, you can find them in the show notes at writersdetective.com forward slash 66. And to learn about setting up your own Patreon account for your author business, visit writersdetective.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. As I record this, it's day two of NaNoWriMo. It's the 2nd of November, 2019, and I hope you've had a solid start if you are partaking in NaNo, and you might actually just want to hit pause right now and get your word count in. Um, Hopefully this is a prize for you or some sort of little present you're giving yourself after having completed your daily word count. We are just a few days away from 20 Books Vegas, the conference that I'm attending. So if you are attending, please come join me and Patrick O'Donnell from Cops and Writers for happy hour on Tuesday night at Billy Joe's Bar at the conference. And check out our police procedural panel on Thursday at 1 p.m. Patrick's moderating the panel, and I will be one of his speakers. So according to the Shed app, that's like schedule or schedule, S-C-H-E-D, that the conference is using, we already have 142 people attending our panel. So if you are attending 20 Books Vegas, I will include a link in the show notes to the shed.com page where you can RSVP for your seat. And I cannot wait to meet you. All right, so let's get into this week's first question. Nativ Ben Mayer asks, you speak about cops working with PIs and how it is a one-way street. What about expert consultants? Could they get involved in the case as they do on TV shows, or is that pure fiction? What about volunteers? Could they be more involved in the case, or would they be no more than an administrator lackey? Could you even have volunteers involved in a crime or murder investigation? And the obvious follow-up would be a PI which volunteers with the police. Thanks for the questions, Nativ. It isn't pure fiction, but it is far more limited than TV will have you believe in most cases. Most experts get involved with a case when it comes to testimony during trial, to explain to a jury what the expert believes the evidence should mean to them, which leads experts to being called by both the prosecution and the defense, often to provide competing expert analyses. When experts are used by law enforcement during the investigative process, they're being used for a very specific purpose, and the detectives will limit the information given to the expert to only that part of the case for which they need expert advice, and they will intentionally limit how involved the expert actually gets in the investigation itself. Agent Starling? Where the heck did this come from? It's practically mush. It was found behind the soft pallet of a murder victim. The body was in the Elk River in West Virginia. 
It's Buffalo Bill, isn't it? I'm afraid I can't tell you any more about that. We heard about it on the radio. You mean this is like a clue from a real murder case? Cool. Just ignore him. He's not a PhD. When Clarice Starling reaches out to the entomologists in Silence of the Lambs, she doesn't read them in on her serial killer investigation. She needs their expert opinion on the one thing she's inquiring about, and that's it. Also, by limiting the information provided to only what is necessary, it helps prevent any eventual argument by the defense that the experts' opinions were tainted by the investigators. Besides, experts are not, they are people. And people love to talk, especially when they're doing something important. So just like when the entomologists in Silence of the Lambs are asking if it's involving the Buffalo Bill case, she shuts them down. Need to know, right to know is always the smartest play. For your next question, Nativ, volunteers aren't usually too involved in ongoing criminal investigations. We certainly use volunteers for a variety of things, but mostly out in the field for some of the more routine and lower risk tasks. It's certainly possible that an expert in some field might volunteer for a police department, and there may be a remote chance that they somehow stumble into some sort of investigation but they will not be assigned to an investigation or used in any kind of ongoing and meaningful way. Anyone working the investigation is potentially going to be subpoenaed to testify as to what they did involving that case. So using unpaid, non-sworn volunteers is not best practice. But I think I see where you're going with this. So if you really want your expert to be involved in a case, you might consider making them a reserve police officer. Reserves are volunteers that have gone through a modified police academy and field training, and they carry a badge and a gun just like full-time cops. Most agencies don't use reserves as detectives, but that might be one way to get your protagonist's foot in the door as an expert in one field and volunteer in the police force as well. You should be able to find more about reserves in your state by Googling reserve police officer or reserve deputy sheriff and the city or state where you are setting your story. Some states and other in even other countries like the UK may call them auxiliary police officers. So definitely check out the reserve police officer option for making that subject matter expert protagonist of yours also have some sort of limited police power and a legitimate and logical way to get them involved in the investigation. I hope this helps. Thanks for asking the question, Nativ. Our next question comes from Lynn Vitale, one of my longtime followers. Thanks for asking this question, Lynn, uh, who asked this question in our Facebook group this week. If you haven't joined the Facebook group yet, consider this your formal invitation. The easiest way to get there is writersdetectivebureau.com forward slash Facebook. Uh, that link will also be in the show notes. So anyway, Lynn writes, Question, what type of weapon or device would or could have a laser powerful enough to go from the roof of one building into a room of another building across the street? I've not decided if I want it to be a sniper or a sick joke, hence the other device, in quotes. Thank you. Oh, this question really speaks to me because almost every movie I loved as a kid in the 1980s had those telltale red lasers. Terminator, Predator, one of those lethal weapon movies, Cobra, you know, the one where Sylvester Stallone played an LAPD detective, um, Tango and Cash, even the Bond film, The World is Not Enough had them. So it's natural to want to include those little red dot lasers in your story. But I have a secret to share with you. Red dot lasers on a sniper rifle only serve one singular purpose. Can you guess what it is? It's to alert your protagonist to a weapon being pointed at someone, usually resulting in a saved life or stopping some sort of action instantly. Now, my theory on this trope is actually backed up by the folks at tvtropes.org, and there's even a Reddit thread on this topic. But what can I say? I still love my cheesy 1980s action thrillers. 
And uh, no, I won't admit to ever using my taser as the cop version of a cat toy in the station <laughs> because those tasers have those red dot lasers as well. So yeah, um, bad cop, no donut. <laughs> you know, I have one simple request and that is to have sharks with frickin' laser beams attached to their heads. Back to the snipers. Snipers do everything they can to remain invisible, even to the point of having covers over their telescopic non-laser sights to prevent sun glint from giving away their location. And there's also a more technical reason that snipers don't actually use lasers. Lasers travel in a straight line. But the science and art of sniping comes down to calculating trajectory. Bullets do not travel in straight lines. The longer the distance a bullet travels, the more its path looks kind of like a poorly hit golf ball rocketing off of a tee box. There's a slight rise in trajectory and then a big drop. So the further out the target, the more of an arc your bullet has to make for it to hit. And in addition to the drop of the bullet due to velocity changes in gravity, atmospheric things like wind will also affect the path of the bullet, potentially pushing it left, right, or diagonal. And if we're talking about super long range, like special forces operators using a 50 caliber round to reach out a mile or more, that sniper might even factor in the Coriolis effect. But even that, which is the accounting for the Earth's rotation in relation to shot placement and the effect it makes on accuracy, um, that Coriolis effect is also an improperly hyped trope as well. So you might want to stay away from that in addition. I remember seeing that one in a Call of Duty Modern Warfare video game mission once. So sniper tropes are everywhere. Anyway, all of that was to say sniper rounds do not travel in perfect laser-like straight lines. That said, there is a time and place and weapon system for projected lasers, and that is in close combat scenarios, meaning quick reactions at very close range. Some handguns have them equipped, usually as an aftermarket option, and they even come standard on tasers, as I alluded to with my bad cop, no donut, adult cat toy taser comment a second ago. The idea behind the projected laser is that if you see the red dot on your target, you do not need to line up your sights in the traditional way to know that you're on target. So the way that you normally line up your sights on a handgun is there are two dots on the rear of the handgun, um, the rear sight, and then there is one dot on the muzzle end of the handgun. And so you're taking that one dot at the muzzle and you're trying to line it up equally between the two dots on the rear sight. That's how you know you have an accurate sight picture. So if you have a laser, you don't need to line up that sight picture in order to know that you're on target. This close quarters kind of shooting does not require precision as we're talking about a five to 10 yard distance usually. And I should also mention that statistically speaking, very few cops actually carry handguns that project these lasers. There are an increasing number of handguns that have holographic sights mounted on the top of the slide called an RMR. Um, I actually carry one and it allows the shooter to obtain a sight picture without having to align the front and rear sights, kind of like I was talking about with the red dot projected um, and it allows for greater accuracy and faster target acquisition. Um, but the way it works is instead of projecting that dot on your target, you're actually projecting that dot on a little piece of glass that is mounted to the handgun. Because as you get older, or I mean, as your eyes older. You want all the help you can get in a firefight. RMR has become the generic term for a handgun mounted holographic sight, but RMR is actually a trademark of Trigicon, the manufacturer of night sights, and it stands for ruggedized miniature reflex. Reflex sights being a type of holographic sight where a red dot is projected on a glass pane that the shooters use to line up their shot. The other time you'll see lasers will be on carbines or carbines, like an M4 style rifle used by a tactical team for entries into a building. But these will usually be infrared lasers that are only visible while wearing night vision. This provides the significant tactical advantage of being able to operate in darkness 
And being able to see your teammates' lasers both helps to prevent crossfire situations and provides incredible situational awareness when we're talking about cover and zones of fire. But since the laser is IR or infrared, it's invisible to the naked eye. So to give you a better understanding, in the show notes, I will include a link to a short promo video for the movie Zero Dark Thirty that shows you what these rifle-mounted infrared lasers actually look like under night vision. So, Lynn, pretty much any laser, especially a green laser, is bright enough to go the distance you asked about, but any serious shooter wouldn't really be using one. So I hope this helps. This week's next question also came from the Facebook group from Danielle Hanna. Keyword, arrest of a violent suspect. Hello, hello. Hope everyone's writing is going well. Here's my question for the day. It's a small town police department. In the dead of the night, someone brazenly breaks into their record storage room and ends up striking a dispatcher, the only person in the station just then, sending her to the hospital with a concussion. They don't know what kind of weapon was used to hit her other than a blunt instrument. It turns out to be a flashlight. Days later, the department's two detectives receive an anonymous tip, which puts them onto a suspect. They learn where this young man lives, works, and goes to school. He's from a wealthy family and has an impressive record for academic and community achievements, making him a surprising suspect. Since he may be responsible for a violent crime, how would they approach him to ask questions and or make an arrest? I assume they'll want to do it away from a public place, school, and his place of work. Other than that, I can't picture the scenario. Will the detective simply find him at home and question him? Or will they go so far as to call in a SWAT team to make sure he does nothing else violent? At this point, they don't know if he hit the dispatcher with a flashlight or a gun or what. Thanks for the help. P.S. Adam, if you need material for the podcast, feel free to use this. Thanks for the question, Danielle. And yes, I absolutely am using this for the podcast. First of all, violent people that need to go to jail are our bread and butter, everyday kind of thing. So using a blunt object like a flashlight does not make your suspect rise to the level of a SWAT call. Yes, he is violent, but so are many of the people we end up encountering. The only thing that makes this guy different than a drunk in a bar fight is that he had the cojones to break into a police station. And besides, the only thing at this point is the detectives got an anonymous tip, so they certainly don't yet have the probable cause to go and arrest this guy. But for the sake of argument, let's say we have a little bit more than just that. So if that were the case, how I would approach him would have to do with equal parts safety, meaning officer safety and the public safety, and the psychological aspect of whether I want to rattle his cage before the interview. My options would be to, number one, call him and schedule a time for him to come in and talk to me, just like scheduling a job interview, um, which I might do, actually, if I don't have any kind of probable cause. Number two set up a quick surveillance, and pull him over the next time he leaves home or work. Or number three, make a scene by knocking on his door at home or going into his workplace or school and demanding to see him. As you can imagine, all have varying degrees of risk, but they also have vastly different impacts on his state of mind when it comes time for the interview. Scenario number one makes it sound to him like he's a witness, that this is a witness interview, and he might be more willing to talk to me. It's voluntary and friendly, and he's probably thinking, surely I'd have arrested him already if I knew he was guilty, um, or I would have taken a different path at least than just being all civil and calling him up for an appointment if I really thought he was the suspect. Now, this tactic also really gets him thinking for the entire time between setting the appointment and him coming in. Think about the nerves you felt the last time you had to do any kind of public speaking and how long those nerves were with you from the time you realized you had to do it to the time that you actually got to 
stand on stage or, or do that public speaking event. That's a very long time and it can really mess with people's heads. Now start thinking about the stakes that this guy is going to be dealing with in his head of trying to look like you don't know anything or you come up with an alibi or at least you want to appear truthful with whatever answers you have for the questions I'm going to be asking. So honestly, that scenario number one is my best shot at getting him to talk to me. Um, Or if I get resistance on him wanting to set a date to come in, I'll even do the interview right there over the phone. Of of course, it would be a recorded phone call. But the benefit of doing the interview over the phone is that I don't have to read a suspect their rights per the Miranda decision over the phone because it's not a custodial interrogation. The courts have held that a person can hang up the phone whenever they want to and end that conversation. So I may do that conversation or I may do that interview over the phone. Okay, option two, pulling them over. This is a great way to reduce the likelihood of a hostage situation if there's a real violence concern. Honestly, I'm probably not too worried about it with a flashlight thumper, (laughs) but it's a great way to prevent another Branch Davidian Waco, Texas kind of incident from happening. Plus, it reduces the chances of this guy's parents from getting wind of, of the detention and calling the family lawyer. And then option three of going out and grabbing the guy in public uh, from his place of work or from home or school, you guessed it, more people become aware of the investigation, just kind of like I was alluding to in option two. Um, The hauling him down to the station, the potential embarrassment of pulling him out of work or school or from his family, uh, the potential for attorneys to get involved quickly, all reduce the likelihood of actually getting the guy to talk in an interview. It also brings a potential hostage situation if this was really a violent guy, but again, it all has to do with the strategy behind the capture. If I know this guy is going to lawyer up right away, and by that I mean not talk to me at all, regardless of which of those three options I take, he's just not going to talk to me, I may intentionally take option three. And it's not to embarrass or harass him, but to make enough of a commotion or enough of a scene to possibly induce my guy into having to explain what happened to family or friends on a recorded jail phone call, which I get to listen to and use as evidence against him. And one other thing to consider, depending on your young man's, as you referred to him, depending on his age and state, Danielle, there may be additional things to consider if he's actually a juvenile, like a legal requirement to notify the parents um, or a mandatory consultation with an attorney before questioning like we now have in California. So be sure to research that kind of stuff as well. Well, I hope this makes up for last week's short episode. And real quick, before I let you go, Zara Altair, a coffee club member of the Bureau, has released her Write a Killer Mystery online course. It's live right now with a very steep discount for the next two weeks. The discount expires on November 15th, 2019. And I'm not an affiliate for Zara. I'm mentioning her course because she really knows her writing. I'm actually going to enroll in the course today. If you've read the latest APB email from me, you likely clicked on Zara's article, Mystery Novel Four-Act Structure Demystified. Zara has been writing for decades, and she has a bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley in English and a master's degree in literature from San Francisco State University. Suffice it to say, she knows her stuff. So check out Zara's new class, Write a Killer Mystery, by going to bit.ly, so B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash killer with a capital K, mystery with a capital M. And I'll include the link for that in the show notes at writersdetective.com forward slash 66. So I hope to see you in the course with me as well. And thank you so much for listening this week. Keep those questions coming. You can send me your crime fiction questions by going to writersdetective.com forward slash podcast. Thanks again for listening. Have a great week and write well.